Hi class and welcome to the screencast over gene expression in eukaryotes. So we've already looked at gene expression in prokaryotes and now the culminating sort of chapter in this unit on molecular genetics is going to bring all of this together as we look at how eukaryotes regulate their level of transcription and translation and how this relates to in fact the way that all organis organisms are developed from the embryonic stage. So we're going to start um, at the very beginning and the key item here is to understand that gene regulation results in differential gene expression, which leads to cell specialization. Every single one of your cells has exactly the same DNA in it, but your cells have different functions, and this all comes about because of differential gene expression, which genes get transcribed and which ones do not, and this leads uh, down on the line to cell specialization. So there are all sorts of ways and levels at which uh, eukaryotes can control gene expression. You can control it right away at the transcription level, um, so tr or regulating what gets transcribed. You can regulate, remember, exon shuffling, so you can regulate what you determine as an intron versus an axon. You can even regulate what gets exported out of the nucleus. And finally, you can uh, regulate how it's translated. And there's actually one more. Down here, once the protein is made, you can actually then modify the protein and change its shape, which can therefore change its function. So lots of different ways and areas where we can regulate differential gene expression and cell function. Let's, so let's go to the beginning and look at how our DNA is actually organized um, so that we can get a better idea of how it functions. Because remember, structure and function go hand in hand. You probably remember this figure from the DNA video, which is showing um, the level all the way from a DNA helix all the way to the chromosome that you see in a karyotype. We're going to zoom in down just on these first four. So remember that um, the DNA double helix actually winds around proteins, and these are called histone proteins, and this is called a nucleosome. So a nucleosome is simply DNA wrapped around these histone proteins, also known as beads on a string. Now these nucleosomes can be loosely packed together, and this is called euchromatin, or they can be tightly packed together, and this is called heterochromatin. Now I'm making this differentiation because it's important. So we can regulate chromatin structure. So genes that have highly packed heterochromatin are usually not expressed. Because they're so tightly packed, RNA polymerase cannot get in there and it cannot read that DNA. While euchromatin, the loosely packed, RNA polymerase can get in there and so it is expressed. So just to review, heterochromatin, no to little expression, euchromatin, yes expression. Now there's another way, there's actually two more ways we're gonna discuss that you can regulate chromatin structure. Um, the first way of the two is called uh, acetylation, acetylation of histones or histone acetylation. So histones actually have these little tails on them, and the cell can add um, acetyl groups to these tails. And this somehow, through some mechanism, actually loosens chromatin structure. And therefore, as you can imagine, it's going to increase transcription. So here we have some very, very tightly packed uh, histones. We acetylate them, now they're loosely packed, and now RNA polymerase can get in there and read them more easily. Now the other way has the opposite effect. This is called DNA methylation. DNA methyl methylation is exactly what it sounds like. You're adding methyl groups to certain bases in DNA, and this causes the DNA to actually pack closer together, so this is going to reduce transcription. And in fact, um, in some species, DNA methylation can cause long-term inactivation of genes early on in cellular differentiation. So histone acetylation and DNA methylation. So here's a quick fig figure showing the difference between the two. Methylation occurs on the DNA, acetylation occurs on the histones. Again, just a sort of summary slide here um, of when it's switched on and when it's switched off. So you can take a look at that uh, on your own. So review, histone acetylation, more transcription, it's loose. DNA methylation, less transcription, it's being tightly packed together. Okay, so let's move on to our sort of next point here. Not all genes are expressed at the same time, which I stated at the beginning of the video. Slight differences in expression lead to phenotypic changes between individuals, but the real question is, how does the cell know which genes to transcribe and which genes not to transcribe? So this is what we're gonna talk about in the second part of the video. So at the transcription level, at that first level of regulation, we have something called transcription factors. TFs help RNA polymerase to bind to the promoters. Remember that those certain DNA regions that we learned about with the operon, well, eukaryotes also have promoters. And transcription factors help the RNA polymerase to bind. So those would be called 
activators. Now, there are also some transcription factors that act as repressors and actually inhibit RNA polymerase from binding. So you have both that on and off control there. And the specific combination of all of these, and there's hundreds of transcription factors, actually determine how much gene product will be made, will be transcribed, if any product will be made at all. So here's just a, a small figure showing you this. So here's the DNA strand. This is the gene. Here's the promoter here. Remember, this is uh, where the RNA polymerase binds. It's a regulatory sequence that controls transcription. And then up here, we've got these transcription factors that are going to interact very closely with RNA polymerase to either help it bind or to inhibit it from binding. So that's, an, that's one way that eukaryotes can control transcription using transcription factors. But your next question should be, well, what activates the transcription factors? Well, this is called signal transmission. So signal transmission between and even within cells can mediate these transcription factors and therefore mediate gene expression. Um, one example I'd like to share is cytokines. We just discussed earlier in the year with the cell cycle, the idea of cytokines and growth factors regulating the cell cycle, pushing it forward. Um, so they can regulate gene expression to allow for the cell cycle to go forth, for the cell to replicate and divide. So you don't certainly do not have to know this figure, but this is just an example of this signal, signal transmission. So we have this growth factor here, and it gives the signal all the way down until it goes into the nucleus, and that signal is going to activate a transcription factor in order to uh, release this gene product that's going to uh, increase cell division. So that's one example. Another example is the activation of transcription factors um, of the SRY gene. Remember we learned with the sex-linked uh, genetics that the SRY gene is on the Y chromosome. It's one of the only genes on there. And this is then going to trigger another similar pathway uh, to uh, promote male sexual development pathway in animals. Okay, but what happens when gene expression goes wrong? Earlier in the year, we also talked about, see how I said this was a culmination video? We talked about cancer, right? Uh, when we looked at the Henrietta Lacks and her um, karyotype. So let's review some of these terms. Proto-oncogenes, remember, are normal cellular genes that code for proteins that stimulate normal cell growth. So they're normal, and they help your cell cycle to grow and to divide. An example of this is the RAS gene. Now, an oncogene is not good. This is a cancer-causing gene. So what can happen is, is we can have a normal proto-oncogene. We can have something go wrong, a mutation happen, that can turn it into an oncogene. And so now this oncogene is going to um, stimulate lots and lots of transcription factors, which is going to promote more cell division, like we saw in the previous slide, which then leads to cancer. Because remember, cancer is simply uncontrolled cell division. So if at any point this gene regulation goes awry, we could have cancer develop in our cells. Okay, there's a, another um, a sort of cancer regulator called a tumor suppressor protein. So this is a specific transcription factor that promotes synthesis of cell cycle inhibiting proteins. The best example is the P53 gene. Um, it's called the guardian angel of the genome. So when there is P53, it recognizes when there's a mutation, and so it sends out these proteins to inhibit the cell cycle. Stop making cells because something has gone wrong. So you can imagine when there's no P53, there's no inhibition of this excess growth, and so cancer can develop. So signal transmission is going to be very important in gene expression. It's also going to be very important in mediating cell function, uh, which sort of is the, the next step of this. Um, so differences come in because of, of gene expression, not because of the DNA. Now here's the last part of the video. These differences arise during development as regulatory mechanisms are, and genes are turned off and on very early on in an organism's de development. So let's take a look at this. Development has three processes, cell division, and then cell differentiation comes next, and finally morphogenesis, which is actually the creation of the physical form. Now, we are going to look at, especially this coming week, something called Hox genes. Hox genes, uh, biologists have found across all organisms, are so incredibly important to embryo development across all domains, um, which is really, really exciting. The model organism that biologists use, we call them evolutionary biologists, is again Drosophila. Remember, we looked at this fly when we did genetics. And so they've done a lot of molecular analysis on this, and they have found these homeotic genes, also called Hox genes, and that all of these Hox genes contain a sequence called a homeobox. And this homeobox is so highly conserved across all species. I'll show you a figure here of that in a second. 
Um, so identical and very similar sequences have been found. And so what we're seeing here in these colors is how these different homeoboxes code for very specific segments of the Drosophila body. So this here is coding for that, that thorax region, and this is coding for the abdomen, and these are coding for the legs. Um, and you're, we're gonna see that these similar genes code for the same similar regions in vastly different organisms. So again, these are called homeotic or Hox genes. So here's the figure I was telling you about that shows how um, in all of these very, very diverse organisms, all of these homeoboxes in red are going to code for something um, near that head of that organism. And the, the green is going to code for that abdomen or that body of that organism. Um, so when you think about evolution, this is just amazing. I mean, this is molecular evidence for evolution. So widespread conservation of these developmental genes. And <clears throat> Um, these have been found in yeast, plants, prokaryotes. So in, in, in addition to these developmental genes, many other genes have also been found to be highly conserved from species to species. And that's going to do it for this video on eukaryotic gene expression.